Hi again, Westside friends and family. As we continue looking at the Gospel of Mark today, I will confess this is a very challenging and convicting passage. And so be ready. I went to a commentary by a really wonderful pastor named Ray Stedman out of California for some of this material. And you may want to look at that as well because it's, it's such a deep, call that Jesus has on our life is he asks the question, what does it mean to be one of his disciples? Is Jesus both our Savior and our Lord? We like to throw that phrase around. Oh, Jesus, he's my Lord and Savior. And I think most of us know we need a Savior. We're pretty aware of our sin and our need to be rescued. But if you're like me, having a Lord Somebody in charge of our lives is not always what we're looking for, if we're honest. Anyway, I pray that this passage will speak to you and also draw us a little closer to Jesus as the followers of his that we want to be. So let's look today at John chapter 8, starting with verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his, his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. So here we see a bit of a turn in the Gospel of Mark. The first part of Mark, the author is showing Jesus as the anointed Messiah. He is coming with power and he's showing the world that he's God. He's, he's restoring and he's teaching and he's healing and he's feeding and all these miraculous signs to show the audience that Jesus is truly the Messiah. Now, at this part of Mark, we start to see Jesus turn towards what it's going to cost him to be our Savior. And Jesus now starts the horrendous journey um, thinking about and going toward the cross. And that's fitting for us as we're in the season of Lent. So he tells the crowd that if you want to be his disciple, which of course all of us do, that's why you're watching today. If you want to be my disciple, you need to do three things. You need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Three really difficult things. And it's at this point that the gospel writer in John tells us that many, many people began to leave because the cost of being a disciple seemed, you know, way too crazy and, and hard. But let's look a little bit about more about what these three things mean. First of all, when Jesus says, deny yourself, He's not talking about self-denial, like we sometimes think of when we hear that word. He's not saying that we should deny who we are, but we should recognize whose we are. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So he's, when, he says, when Jesus says that we're to deny ourselves, he's talking about denying our rights, our rights to ourselves our rights to our own agenda, our own decision-making, our, our own plans, our own needs and wants. And I have to be honest, I think we're really entitled sometimes, and it's hard for me personally to always deny myself the things that I want. I, I know that this is what Jesus is teaching, that in order for us to call Jesus our Lord and Savior, we need to bow and recognize that he's much better at being in charge of our lives than we are. And truly, 
if I remember that he's good and loving, then it's much easier for me to invite him in to do what he wants to do with my life. In fact, I have to remind myself sometimes that that's what I do as a parent every day. When I was a younger mom, a wiser mom told me that one of the main jobs of teaching little ones at the beginning is to help them understand that the parents are the boss. Because they're not going to get it developmentally, some of the reasoning and the nuances behind the things that you say, like don't run into the street or you can't have candy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They're not, they're not going to understand that. They just have to know to trust you, you are good, you are loving, and they need to follow and obey you. And that stuck with me because she said, this mom was telling me, it's so much easier then for kids who've learned to do that with their parents to be able to learn to do that with God. And it makes sense that if we're able to, to trust an earthly parent and obey an earthly parent, then it's going to be easier to, to deny ourselves and trust our heavenly parent. And so when I think about denying myself, I think what Jesus, who Jesus is. He is the creator of the world. He knows way better than I do how my life should run. He made me. He made you. And so when we relinquish our rights uh, and put, let God be in charge of our lives, we're really doing a good thing, even though it may not feel like it sometimes. Um, and I know that uh, I think for us, especially in America, who we all love our rights, our freedoms, that this might be especially hard for us. And we may just have to confess today, as I did in preparation for today's devotion, Lord, I'm really bad at this. I really need your help um, in denying myself. And again, it's not about denying who we are, the gifts, the wiring. It's just remembering whose we are. And you think of all the analogies you've heard over the years. You know, if you're a soldier in, in, in the military, if you're a player on any kind of sports team, the coach, the general, they're in charge, and you trust them, and you you really give up your rights to be a part of that team. And Jesus is saying the same thing. If we want to be a disciple, he's got to be more than just our Savior. He has to be our Lord. So he says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So it's the second thing that Jesus says, take up your cross. Not any easier. This is not... A simple thing, and I'm not sure if the disciples even understood what Jesus was talking about here because this was a Roman penalty for the worst kind of criminals. And I'm fairly certain that they had no idea that that's what Jesus um, was going to have to face. But, but Jesus knew. And the Roman audience would know exactly what Jesus was alluding to. Take up your cross. And... When we think about what the cross me meant for Jesus, it was a humiliating, degrading uh, death. He was naked and tortured, and it's, it's something that no one would want to go through. And so when we think about taking up our cross, we think about anything that exposes us, that might even humiliate us, um, and show the places in our lives where we're not living with integrity, where there may be fraud, in our, and disingenuousness in our hearts. Jesus says, welcome those times because it exposes who you are and it allows you to see your need for me. You're, you're, you need to see that you need a savior, you need a rescuer. And so he's not talking about those you know, handicaps or um, difficulties that sometimes people talk about taking up their cross, they have a difficult mother-in-law. That's not what he's talking about here. Jesus had lots of difficulties in his ministry before he went to the cross. He's talking about those really humiliating, challenging things that, that allow us to see our need for a savior. So maybe it means that we forgive someone when they forget our name, or when we lose an argument because we'd rather be kind than be right. Um, it certainly isn't the same as our brothers and sisters in different parts of the world, when they make a decision to follow Christ, for them, they understand that it might mean that their family turns their backs on them for their decision to follow Jesus. It may mean that they lose their job, or they're even arrested or put in prison or death. I think in other parts of the world, when they make a decision to follow Jesus, they count the cost. 
in America and Western Christianity, I think too often we are cajoled into following Jesus because it'll make our lives better and easier. And I'm not sure if we count the costs the same way that Jesus is calling us to do here in this passage. I know that today I read in the Christian posts that some people who followed Jesus in Venezuela, some horrible people captured them and scraped into their skin uh, a cross and beat them, and two of them I think were hospitalized. And I was reading that today and I couldn't help but think of this passage that we're talking about. They're following Jesus and counting the cost and paying the cost in a way that you and I don't generally think about. We don't want to think about it. Who does? Um, but it's something that Jesus is definitely bringing to our attention. In big ways and small ways, we're to pick up our cross and to allow Jesus to lead us the way that is best, even when it's hard, even when it means suffering. We deny ourselves, we pick up our cross, and we follow him. If we want to be a disciple, that's the three prescriptions that Jesus gives us. And the third one, following him, just means obedience. Obedience is pretty much the name of the game uh, in Christianity, right? Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you'll obey me. And that means, again, even when it's not easy, even when I have to forgive that horrible family member who's treated me so badly, even when I have to share and I don't feel like it, you know, even when I have to love that person who's been so unkind, there's a million examples, right, in your life and my life, of things that Jesus calls us to do, and we're just not feeling it. And again, this is where we are called to be honest. Jesus sees everything about us anyway, and we just cry out to the Lord, help, help me, God. Help me obey you. If we're truly honest, sometimes we can tell the Lord, I don't even feel like it. I really don't feel like it right now, Lord, so you're going to have to help me. Please help me. And I think Jesus honors those kinds of really honest prayers. And he finally, he gives us some motivation why we'd want to do this and be his disciple. And this is huge. This is key. Starting in verse 35. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what could anyone give in exchange for their soul? Jesus is saying if you want real life, and who doesn't, if you don't want to lose your life, then you're going to give it to him. Because he alone holds the key to giving us true and meaningful life, not only in this world, but in the world to come. And sometimes we're seduced into thinking that real life comes by our possessions or our status or how people think about us. And it's, it's really not those things at all. It comes from knowing that we're loved and redeemed and we're walking in faith with the God of the universe who paid for us on the cross to be forgiven and adopted into his family. And so Jesus is holding out the keys of real life here and he's giving us the motivation to think not just of this world, but of the world to come. Reminding us that he alone holds the keys to paradise and to heaven. And Jesus is truly um, showing us why this is so important. And then he closes with this uh, kind of intriguing uh, promise when he says this, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And in another passage he says, But if anyone proclaims me, then I too will proclaim him before my Father in heaven. Again, if we are going to be disciples of Jesus, we want to be able to do it lovingly and boldly so that people can see we don't want to hide our light under a bushel, as we talked about earlier in the Gospel of Mark. But we want to be bright lights for the Lord. We want to make the world a better place and be the salt of truth and kindness that he calls us to be as his disciples. I think it's too easy for me to bemoan this crazy broken world 
and, and point to all the things that are going badly and poorly. And I'm convicted that instead of just looking at the world and blaming the world, to turn that focus on me and say, well, why, where's my light and salt? How am I making a difference so that this world is more loving and kinder and, and a more just and true place to be? You can't really blame the world. They don't know the Lord. We, God's people, the Lord's disciples are the, one, the ones that are called to make the world a better place by God's grace and his power in, inside of us. And then the last verse of today's uh, passage, Jesus says, And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with power. So many commentators believe that Jesus is talking about the transfiguration, the kingdom of God coming with power, because he's about to go up into a mountain and see Elijah and Moses and, and be completely changed in his appearance. Um, and so... This is what he's saying, that you're going to get a taste of this kingdom that's not of this world in, in very short time, and some of you are going to get to see it. And Peter, James, and John went up on the mountain and with Jesus and, and saw that amazing thing. And that's the key for all of us, I think, today, who want to be Jesus' disciple, is to remember that, yeah, there's going to be suffering in this world, but it's so worth it when we see Jesus face to face. Jesus told us, in this world you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We know we're going to face trouble, and it's, it's not fun, and none of us want to. But as the Apostle Paul said, he counted everything in his life, all his pedigrees, all his possessions, all his status, as garbage compared to knowing Jesus. This is hard stuff. I really struggle with this. It's, it's been an emotional passage to go through. Looking at myself and the yucky stuff about me that I don't like, my selfishness and my entitledness, and I don't want to stay there. I don't want to live there. I want the Lord to transform me and allow me to be able to deny myself more and more and pick up my cross and follow Jesus more fully. Thankfully, we don't have to do that alone. Jesus longs to help us. Because of what he did on the cross, there's ultimate forgiveness when we blow it, which we do every day, and we start again, and we, we try again. And that's the only hope that we can, um, as the John the Baptist said, his prayer, his, his cry, that was that he would decrease and Jesus would increase. And that's really what we want in our lives, that we, our motives, our agendas, our selfishness would decrease, and Jesus' love and truth in us would increase. And because you know I love to do this, for those of you that like to enjoy contemporary worship with me, I want to leave you again with Zach Williams' uh, new song called Less of Me, uh, especially if you want to hear a little bit of a newer version on this thought. I've been singing that this week, too, as I think about this idea. So let me pray for us, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Father, so much that you're honest with us about what it means to be your disciple. You are truly uh, forthright with us. And so I pray now for all of us today that we could trust you as a child trusts their parent, that we could trust that you are a good and loving God that you see things that we don't see, you understand things that we cannot possibly understand with our human finite minds. And Lord, you have good things planned for us. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, our human minds have not even conceived the wonderful things you've planned for those of us you've called and who you love. So God, help us all because we want to be your disciples. Help us to deny our fleshly selves and to pick up our crosses every day and to follow you more and more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you next time.